right now, a, a short chat with um, two guys from Sun, uh, from Sage, sorry, Adam Booker and Richard Warlock. Uh, one is the um, is supposed to be the talent, and one is supposed to be the management. I'm not quite sure which way around it is, but if you could bring them both up, that'd be great. Hello. 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 Good. How are you? Yeah, very well, thank you. Good, How's good, good. Well, it's gone very well so far. Thank you very much. So uh, we've got about 20 minutes or so just to cover this. Uh, can you give us a bit of introduction, sorry, with you, Richard, about who you are? Sure. Here? So I'm definitely not the talent. <laughs> I can verify that. Um, yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Rich Walwork. I've been working in IT and information security for, I don't know, 25 years. Yeah, I know. I don't look that old. And um, I currently have a, a, a managerial role at Sage Software, a software company at heart. Um, we have quite a diverse security team, and I manage one of the security teams within the portfolio called the security compliance team. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, Adam, can I ask you to do the same? Yes, yes, no problem. problem. Um, so so uh, I, uh, I'm Armando Bubra. Um, I work um, for Rich um, in the compliance team. team. Um, I've, I've been, been in the team just under, uh, just, just about a year, year now, um, working, working in the um, compliance function. Um, had a bit of uh, experience working with Sage beforehand in sort of a support analyst role, role but um, moving across. across. Excellent. Thanks, Adam. Well, I'll come back to that. And, uh, we'll start with Richard, if you don't mind. And uh, So you said he'd been 25 years in experience. I couldn't believe it, but there you go. How did you get into the business? Yeah, um, so I, I, I'm not a university student. I, uh, I had options to go to university. I, you know, when I, when I was a younger man, um, I, I, had a, I was fascinated with economics and um, I got my A-levels and I thought I was going to university. Then, then things suddenly changed and um, I didn't. I went into the manuf manufacturing industry. I went in, as, in a technical role into their IT department. Um, you know, in, you know, back in the 90s, uh, IT departments were you either worked in, uh, in the infrastructure side of the business or maybe you worked in the software engineering side of the business. I, I was in the infrastructure side of the business. Uh, that just led into a small progression within, within that business. Then I moved into a different sector. I, I moved to London. I moved into financial services. And, it, you know, just through natural progression. Uh, and then at around the turn of the century, I would say, maybe in the early noughts, it just became obvious that most companies didn't really have an information security department, right? They had like one guy, maybe, tops. So I was like, like at, that, at that breaking point where organizations realized, hang on, we need to start setting up teams of people who understand what needs to be done. So I was, in, I was almost in that wave in the early noughts uh, where, where information security was becoming a real thing. And in those days, we didn't even call it cyber security, right? It was just information security. So, you know, 15 years later, 20 years later, whatever it is, I, you know, again, I think during that 15, 20 years, information security has revolutionized itself time and time again. And I'm, I'm still riding the wave and uh, it's exciting times. Yeah. Sure. So what about management? How long have you been in that? Was that something that you set out to do? Um, I think, I don't really know how I fell into it. I guess it was, you know, first of all, going back to um, setting up of a team, somebody's got to lead the team. Maybe people who were making decisions at that point felt my people's skills were, were better than my colleagues. Maybe that made me the manager and it might have just been something like that. And, you know, in my time, so I, at that point, I, I guess I took a kind of like a at some point in the early noughts, I took a look and said, okay, I either want to be the technical guy with my head in the, in the textbooks, working out what the best routing protocols are and all of that kind of stuff, or I actually want to be kind of like managing the team, setting direction, which way do I want to go? And it's not, not often can you do both. So, um, you know, who knows what my decision-making process was 12, 15 years ago, but I kind of decided, okay, I've Let's lessen less less with the textbooks and more with the, the managing of people and the people skills, and let's see how it goes. Excellent, excellent. So back to you, Adam. Now, I think uh, hopefully, but yeah, sound problems uh, uh, sorted. Um, and hopefully, <laughs> you seem to come in a different route from, uh, from uh, Richard. Can you tell us how you got started? Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. Um, is, is my mic okay? okay? Is the, the feedback, feedback okay, okay on, on right now? now? Repeat, but don't worry. 
Uh, no problem. Um, um, so um, I, 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 yeah, so I went to the university, um, I did a bachelor's in computing, um, and then uh, I, I, I sort, sort of wanted to, to get, get, you know, go, go out into the industry and you know, try and find a, um, sort of a, a job that would essentially uh, translate the skills that I picked up, you know, in computing. Um, and, you know, so for example, a developer, um, you know, not very good at coding, not something that I originally was, uh, was interested in. Um, and then, and then I, I, got I got the opportunity to do a master's um, in cybersecurity um, and human factors at Newcastle Uni. Um, so I ended up doing um, that course there and um, finishing the course. Um, and then I just started looking for, for roles because it's originally I'm from down south and I wanted to stay up in Newcastle. Um, so I got a, an entry level role um, at stage as a support analyst. So doing some database administration, providing some customer support for um, one of the sort of smaller niche products. Um, and then I was given the, the opportunity to apply for um, the cybersecurity uh, graduate scheme at Sage. Um, I was sorry, I say Sage internally. Um, and uh, never looked back. I was really nervous, was quite apprehensive about applying for it because I hadn't done a lot, you know, regarding security sort of three years prior. Um, but yes, um, really glad I took the opportunity here I right am. Now. So is there an actual uh, program, a graduate program, or is this just a fancy book? No, no there, 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 there is, is, there, there, there is, there is, um, <laughs> there is um, a, a graduate, graduate program, program and it, it's, it's not just um, related to cyber security. Um, so uh, the, the intake, intake that we had this year was, um, there, was, there, was there was a couple of us, so um, I joined the compliance um, and then had um, somebody else join um, the, um, the, the red team. Um, but, but there, there are there are, are um, a, a wide variety of graduate, graduate programs, programs at stage sort of within security and outside security. Okay, cool. If I could come back to Richard, then tell us a bit about your team. How big is it? What does it do? So the the overall information security team is about fifty people plus, and um, we generally have. So it's easier to describe the overall team, I guess. So the overall team is, is fifty people plus. Um, we report up into the legal function within SAGE. And we have, you know, as a, as a body of people, we have responsibilities for the, the security and integrity of all of our customers and all of our customers, you know, data, depending on what type of contract they have with us. We've got different models, okay? Um, and at the same time, we're also responsible for all of our SAGE colleagues and ourselves as a business, as an operating business. So we've got these two big lenses to look at. The safety and security of our customers, the safety and security of Sage itself. And maybe those 50 people might have, some roles might be focused more to the customers, some roles might be focused more to keeping safe. Sage as a secure organization. Some might do a little bit of both. It's not always straightforward. Uh, within the security organization, we have an engineering team, we have uh, so, so teams that are constantly looking at, at the, the best and the most safest ways of deploying security throughout our organization in a way that doesn't, doesn't take a lot of manpower and is all automated and using the latest, the best available technologies. We have a, a group of guys who are much more focused on application security, um, and, and they would mostly be focused on our customers and, and the products and services that the customers might be consuming. We have like a red team, an off offensive team, if you like, um, doing surprise testing. So it's a team mostly full of ex-penetration testers who will surprise the business with something that, you know, will find, uh, you know, something. Um, and then you have, uh, there's maybe a couple of other teams, of course. And then you have my team, which is the security compliance team. And, and what we're mostly responsible for in the elevator pitch, I think, would be making sure that our people in Sage are, have the ability to work within the, the Sage security fabric and aren't doing silly things and aren't breaking policy knowingly or unknowingly, right? They make sure that they're holding up to the values of Sage. Um, and also the, the other side, flip side of that is we want to be able to measure the success, the successes of our customer services. We have a security framework. It can be very detailed depending on what aspect of security. Uh, and one of the things that the team needs to do is, is manage the, um, to make sure that the, the, the customer services are meeting the requirements of that security framework, that if we have an issue, that somebody's 
it's being managed in a vulnerability management program and a risk management program uh, so that we always know what's good and what's bad and we're always doing things about the what's bad and we're always and we're always trying to improve the what's good right so I, I would say it, you know in general terms that that's what my team does so we might have some very specific things like PCI compliance or compliance to ISO 27001 depending on what the body of work is Adam does an exceptional amount of work for us, a, a great amount, you know, great work for us around the supply chain, supplier due diligence, thousands of suppliers that, that, that Sage interact with on a daily basis. So the, there are very niche programs within, within, within my team, but it's generally to make sure that we're operating in a way that doesn't break any contracts, doesn't break any laws, and that naughty people are caught and they're stopped. Right? Okay, so, so what you, you kind of went into what was maybe the most rewarding aspect of managing the team how do you find right, managing technical and security people yeah I mean, it's tricky i mean i i must admit as i get older i'm finding myself less especially with the you know the the adoption of the cloud the way that we now build services through code the the the, the advances in devops and and uh, and areas like that i find it very difficult to stay in, completely in touch with the very technical guys um, so that that's definitely challenging, and I, I love it when somebody makes me look foolish because I've not quite understood how from code you can build a service in 30 seconds these days. Where I, I want to think about tin and architecture, uh, like like it's 2005 still. So that's very very tricky to stay up to date with the, the technical skills. However, on the flip side of that, you shouldn't worry about that stuff too much because that's why you hire great technical people. They care about that stuff, and that you can get the precise details from them. Um, so I'd say it's kind of like great to feel with these like with these more technical driven people working on things that weren't even available ten years ago. It's a, so it's an ever shifting plate. The fundamentals don't really change, but it's ever shifting. And you, you kind of like, you, you know, you stand still for like three years, you, you've lost touch. It's so tricky. It is so tricky. A ton of great talent. Let's go back to Adam. And uh, I'm going to ask you a similar question. Where do you fit in the team, Adam? And uh, what did you find most challenging when you first joined the team? Um, so I'll, I'll probably, yeah, yeah I'll like start, start off with um, the, 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 the most reverse I'll start with the most challenging and then see where, where I fit in the team. Um, so um, coming into, into, you know, coming into a, a security role without um, an in industry experience and more just the sort of the, you know, the education experience, so concepts that you've, um, you've done coursework on, concepts that you've, you know, done exams on. Um, I sort of felt, um, I, I sort of, I, I talked to Rich about it all the time, but a bit of an imposter syndrome. Um, so, so when, when I, was I was given tasks to do, such, such as, you know, starting off with supply due diligence, um, you know, you know we, we were looking, you know, we're looking at some technical controls, controls we're looking at what's best for us, what, you know, what we would like from, from vendors to sort of show us. Um, you know, when, when I first started speaking to these vendors, um, because I've not been in a role, um, you know, that long, like, you know, just less than, less than a year, I sort of felt at times that, you know, maybe what I was saying, um, not necessarily that it was wrong, you know, but, um, have, have I covered, covered everything, everything and, and, and sort, sort of second, second guessing myself? myself. Um, but, but I would have, have to say that the support, support obviously from from from, from, from you know from Rachel and the rest of the team um, absolutely sort of helped, helped and, and you know it, it, it definitely sort of helped, helped my development um, going, going forward. forward. But yeah, yeah de definitely, definitely, yeah, definitely, definitely a bit of stage fright, right, definitely a bit of imposter syndrome. It's probably what was challenging at the start. And then regarding to sort of where do I fit in? So. Um, as as um, currently, um, I do, do, I do, I do quite, quite a bit of vendor due diligence. diligence. Um, so, so, like I say, we assess um, the controls and um, security postures of vendors that, that we would like to work, work with, with, you know, um, regardless of, sort of the, the scope and the size of the project. Um, we, we look at vendors, how, you know, what their controls are like, how they operate, um, whether or not obviously that meets, that meets our baseline standard. Uh, as you can imagine, there is a large, a large amount of uh, vendors, obviously, that we that we process uh, sort of day to day, day month, month to month. Um, um, as, as well as that, that um, providing sort of internal support to um, other parts of uh, other parts of the business. Um, so my background was I used to work in customer services, so quite a few managers who I used to work with, all the ones that I've never spoken to before, and um, if they've got any questions or you know that they've got some projects or picking up you know, I don't know, let's, let's say they're managing a new team with a new bit of software and there's a couple of security concerns, they do tend to come to the team 
um, straight away and, uh, you know, you know find myself sort of advising them on, on what we think would be best. best. So, so it's, 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 it's a, yeah, yeah, very raw. Right, so I'm going to ask you a very unfair question. But, uh, so um, what makes a great manager for someone like yourself? Um, well, well uh, to, to be honest, honest I, I, I think, think the key thing, uh, regardless of the role, would be support. Um, I, I, think I think at the end of the day, you know, when, regardless of the role that you're doing, um, you know, you're, you're given a set of tasks or a set of objectives that you, you want to achieve. Um, and I think being able to have someone to sound off your ideas, um, or talk about maybe some concerns or maybe some things which you know, you'd like to do differently or we should be doing differently, for example, that would make achieving those objectives currently and in the future easier. Um, it, yeah, yeah, having, having, having a support and managing, managing and having someone on there to sort of, as I say, um, assist you and be able to sort of talk ideas with. I think that's the most important thing. thing. And I, I do, do have, have that, that, by the way, like I said, for the, <laughs> for the <laughs> record. <laughs> well, we've given that uh, question on its head for Richard. And what makes a great technical appointment? Uh, well, I mean, when you can get somebody who, because anybody can learn the technical stuff, right? It's just, that's just, you know, it just can be done. So everybody that you work with will all, you'll always be onboarding them with a slightly different level, but you know where they need to get to and some will get there quicker than others. So a little bit of patience is perhaps required. Yeah. So everybody comes on with a little bit of different technical skills, but I think one of the things that I, I look for because technical can be learned and the hardest thing maybe, and especially in a large organization, we've got 13,000 people, right? So Adam's going to be exposed to different levels of people, different backgrounds. It's going to be very difficult for him to kind of work out how quickly this particular company works. Uh, so people skills, right, is just so important. Uh, and, and the idea that you can maybe take a technical issue and explain it in very plain English so somebody non-technical can understand. And I think if you can do that consistently, then you're halfway to winning, really. Um, because, you know, most people don't speak the techno speak, right? And, um, you know, so if you can, if you can m make sure that you can always articulate what the problem is, what the risk is, why are we making it into an issue or whatever it would be, happen to be doing. Uh, and you can do that in very plain speak, then you're winning. And that's what I really look for. Because the technical can all be learned. Excellent. Yeah. So we're running out of time, as always, Richard, but turn. One final question for you, and if you could just keep the answer short, what advice would you give for someone looking for a career in cybersecurity? Um, I would probably say um, take every opportunity and every, any development opportunity you get um, with, with both hands. Um, that's something which I wish I could sort of go back in time um, when I was in the cybersecurity sort of sector of stage, and I wish I'd sort of um, you know, you know, looked at more conferences, conferences um, sort, sort of actually, regardless of if there's a vacancy or not, inquired about what a specialist would look like or what this specific role would look like and make sure that I had those skills or I could achieve being able to have those skills. So take any, take any opportunity and don't be afraid to ask questions. That, that's, that's definitely the, the advice I give. Excellent. Thanks. And Richard, are you back? Or? I am back, I think, I hope. I <laughs> then. Uh, what advice would you give for someone looking for a career in cybersecurity? Um, well, they should be excited about it. I mean, this is, I, I remember talking to my colleagues in like 2005 thinking, where's security going to go? Right. And it, and it, it and the, the, okay, the roles are slightly different now. The, the, uh, it's much more of like a DevOps environment potentially. So I think engineers and coders are going to do exceptionally well. Um, uh, but what an exciting industry to get into. And um, I, I just last year I was, I was working in Australia, just doing a pet project for the company, and they are crying out for cybersecurity people. They haven't got any, right? So, you know, if if you're prepared to travel, I don't suggest you have to go to Australia. If you're prepared to travel even within a country, there are so many opportunities. I, I think it's Finley Boots time. I'd be very excited about it if I was a young person. This, this is an industry that didn't even really. Have a, have a niche 20 years ago, and now it's, it's boom time. So I think if you're, um, you know, you're willing to develop your engineering skills and your people skills, what's to stop you from, you know, having a, an amazing career? Nothing, right? Absolutely nothing. So, yeah, it's exciting times. Excellent, Richard. Look, thank you very much for that. And Adam, unfortunately, we've run out of time, but thank you very much for your uh, input. Claire, no, 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 no.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.